Yeah, it's a good point, uh, Sam. So all the Zoom sessions and when you get together with your students, you're going to be spending some time, probably all the time, the first session, answering questions like this, getting on, getting familiar with it, making sure everyone can hear, can see the screen properly. This is Paul Wheatcraft. One of the things that came up in the training session yesterday was a suggestion that we hold a practice session with students before the next week and to allow any students who are uncomfortable with this technology so that uh, we don't use quite as much time perhaps on the first class session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can also send students the uh, student help desk link because there is a, a link to a student to the Zoom guide for students there on the student help desk link as well. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, and uh, I've, you've seen the controls here. If you would look at your participant window, uh, I can see that there are 60 of us here today in the session. Look at the bottom of the participant window and you see some icons. Yes, no. Go ahead and click on yes if you can hear me. You've got a yes button at the bottom. Go ahead and click on yes if you can hear me all right. Where does the yes button live? So way at the bottom of the participant window. I, so I, participants, by participants, you want to you want to uh, look in the this lower part of the Zoom window. Put your cursor down there, and uh, a menu of options should open up for you. And one of those options is chat, and another one is participants you'll see a picture of it in the, the screen that I'm sharing with you right now. So that's what you should see. All right. So that's a I'm quick way to- I'm not seeing a yes window, Greg. I'm a little lost. Hmm. Participant window should look like this, except there are 60 of us instead of one. And at the bottom of that, you have some icons. One of them is raise hand. So you can raise hand when you have a question. You've got yes and no. I'm not getting the window, okay. even though I clicked it. Uh, so we'll have to work on that. We'll have to look at that later then uh, individually. So I'm not sure why it's not pulling up for you. So all of you also have a raised hand. I'm going to go ahead and clear out the, the yeses and just go ahead and click on raise hand. When you have a question, you can raise your hand. If you don't have access to that, again, feel free to type questions into the chat. Uh, feel free to uh, interrupt with your microphone. Uh, that's okay if you don't have access to the raise hand. So that's the uh, question. When someone does raise a hand, what do you see or what would we see when somebody raised a hand? Oh, um, go ahead and raise your hand again and look in the participant window. You should see a bunch of hands that just popped up in the participant window. And you would see that as the presenter too? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. So I see it in the participant window. Right. Greg, is Good. there an option to, uh, to put a, a sound on that raise hand? Yeah, that's, there should be. That's more important than the, the ding when somebody enters the room almost. I'm not sure about that. Okay. And there are other icons there. Yes, no, go slower, faster. Under more, you have the thumbs up, down, applause, the coffee cup, you're ready for a break. The students are ready for a break. And the uh, away. So the clock showing that you're away. We're going to go ahead and move on to the questions. We've got Sam Erickson with us today, Paul Wheatcraft, Stacy Williams, and uh, we're going to be answering, trying to answer some questions, uh, discuss some strategies that, that have worked well for online classes or hopefully for you as a remote instructor. So just some advice and try to answer some of your questions as well. Uh, lots of resources on this page that I've sent you, um, so be sure to take a look at the resources at the bottom. We've got Sam Erickson with us today, Paul Wheatcraft, Stacy Williams, and uh, we're going to be answering, trying to answer some questions, uh, discuss some strategies that, that have worked well for online classes or hopefully for you as a remote instructor. So just some advice and try to answer some of your questions as well. Uh, lots of resources on this page that I've sent you. Um, so be sure to take a look at the resources at the bottom. I think you've already gotten into this one. I just want to spend a little bit of time on, on this as we start off. 
the remote instruction guide. <clears throat> if you haven't seen it yet, be sure to go there. You're familiar with uh, the uh, requirements that we're supposed to do now uh, for the remote instruction during the next five weeks of the term. What we're supposed to be able to provide in terms of basic communication, syllabus, instructional materials, um, having students submit assignments. All right, I'm going to let you uh, read through that on your own at some time. But what I want to mention here is, you know, you want to take this take this slowly. Don't feel that you have to plan for the whole term immediately. In a sense, you want to get things ready for week one and. And here's a to-do list for, for week one uh, that you want to work on uh, immediately and have ready, ready to go for Monday, then is what, you, is what you need to do. Identify how you're going to demonstrate activity in the first week for a no-show. So some kind of interaction, engagement, assignment on the part of the students. Maybe it's a discussion, maybe it's something else. Uh, identify how uh, the materials that you would like for week one, what's essential that you'd like to have there. For example, your syllabus, uh, which of course activities are essential for week one and get those added to Brightspace. If there's an assignment they should do, a quiz, a discussion, well, uh, write a, and post a welcome message. So a getting started message uh, for announcements either to announcements for and well definitely to announcements and also you might want to have parts of it in your syllabus as well and then and i'm going to jump over to that that message so here's a sample so following that link sample to a introductory message that you might use you can you can uh, co make a copy of this modify it as you wish Information welcoming students to class. Uh, notice the the brackets here turn this message into a that into the student's first name, the actual first name of the student when they log in. So you but you have to use that actual curly Q bracket in order to to get that. Otherwise, uh, it'll look like that. Hello, first name. You don't want that. Um, yeah, whatever you'd like to welcome students in, uh, whatever way you'd like to to use. Um, these are very unusual times. Okay, you can read through it. Information about when the class would normally meet and what you would like to do. If you would like to use uh, synchronous discussion, then you should talk about that here in this welcome message then. So for example, I've stated here, uh, I'd like to use that time, part of that time each week that we would normally week, uh, meet to have a synchronous discussion. And so you are welcome to, to do that. And you don't have to feel like you need to meet the whole period of time. And in fact, you don't have to actually meet them during that time. But I think it's a good practice to really help the students allow, along to, to actually meet them during the week and use that time uh, to the extent that you can and make yourself available other times as well. Explain your communication policy. Oh, but also in here, I've I've explained that, that Zoom is a tool that we'll be using to, to do that. And I expect students to try to come, make their best effort to attend, but that uh, they will not be penalized uh, because I know there's a lot going on during this time. And I know some may not be able to attend. And the, the sessions will be recorded so they can watch later if they're not able to participate then. Uh, some information about the communication policy. Hey, Greg, um, um, when mm -hmm. you talk about the the, the uh, principles around recording and the announcement of such and um, students' opportunity to step out of that and how that's going with folks. Yeah, right. Okay. You need to let students know that you're going to be recording sessions and students, well, the way students would opt out would be uh, to not use their video in that and to realize that they'll still be that their chat will still be recorded or audio will still be recorded, but uh, not not their video, then it's, I don't know, we don't we don't really see it as, as an issue unless you're cro uh, cross listing courses or trying to combine courses in, in some way and then it becomes a then it becomes an issue. Then it becomes something that you really need to be concerned about and in fact, 
um, cannot cannot do unless you have, I guess, permission. So students are really aware of it and, and agree to that. Then um, I do know there's going to be a communication, further communication about that. They're still discussing the policy, firming it up, and I think there's going to be something uh, coming out from from Katie Ho or from someone. Um, either later today or tomorrow regarding that policy and, and make sure that that we're following the FERPA, FERPA guidelines. But it's definitely important that students are aware uh, that they're being recorded then. Thanks, Sam. Do, Sam, do you have anything to add to that or, or Stacy or Paul, others? No, I just wanted folks to know that that was a question that is being discussed and um, something to pay attention to. Yeah, and I'll say, um, because I teach in communication studies and presentations are a big part, as well as recording them, we have built-in recording equipment in our public speaking classrooms. That's certainly a thing that's been very important to our conversations about public speaking online. Thanks, Stacy and Sam. Right. Also, you want to be sure to have a student Q&A discussion. That's that's part of the, the remote teaching template that all the classroom instructors have been given so students have a place to ask questions in the discussion and we can look at that later if we'd like to um, but have your communication policy students need to know how to how to communicate you uh, with you uh, to ask questions and so you just want to explain that carefully then or, and put your direct email address in there if you'd like to you can make yourself available for office hour office hours by appointment uh, as well. So in my class, I had a Google Doc. Students could sign up for a time to meet with me. And I asked them to do that at least once during the term and meet with me. My class was actually a hybrid, so uh, most of the meetings were face-to-face. -face. Uh, but they had a chance to meet online as well and explain your expectations, an area for that making sure students are reading through the materials and getting started, the course information, and the first module, uh, week one module then. Any expectations uh, about a deadline for something? For example, post your introduction to the discussion board by Thursday, 11 p.m. All right, I mean, you need something to show that the student's going to be active, actively engaged during the first week uh, because you also have to decide on on a no-show policy as well with your students. Um, and attendance, talk about your attendance policy. Uh, use mine, tweak mine, just write your own in there, whatever you'd like. And then finally directing, directing students where to get started in the content link in the navigation bar and what to do next, what to do first as they proceed. So that's the idea of a, a welcome message for students and, and getting them started then. Any questions about that message, about that? Anything? Yes. Mm -hmm. where, where do you recommend putting this message? Um, I'm thinking multiple places, like send it in an email, and then what would be a consistent place to put it in D2L that most people would put it? As well? Yeah, that's a great idea to send it through email uh, as well. So in, in addition to... In addition to an announcement or in the in the activity feed um, right on the on the home page as they enter the class so something that they will see first uh, right here activity feed I would add add an announcement uh, right there so create a post and you can paste it right into that and and uh, and tweak it if you'd like also, I would put it in the syllabus, or at least put parts of it in the syllabus. Some of it's going to be kind of course policy. Part of it's a welcome message, and, and part of it's kind of a course policy message that you could also have in your syllabus. And, uh, and your syllabus will typically go in um, the course information module which right now has nothing in it, but you can upload your syllabus uh, right here into this area, course information. So I would put parts of it or, or all of it in, in both places. And uh, I don't know, others, uh, Paul, Stacy, uh, Sam, other advice on that where you would? Yeah, I think, uh, I think I'd email it to them. I'd 
put it on the front page. I, I, I would put at least the welcome message and the communication guidelines on the first page. And then I'm probably gonna put the rest of it in my syllabus. Um, and then point people to that on a fairly regular basis. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Can I ask when do the um, when do the students actually have access to this? Is it does it start on Monday or are they able to get on now? To Monday, Monday, Monday. Okay. yeah, so, actually okay. Sunday, Sunday at midnight. Okay. Actually, uh, this is Paul Wheatcraft. Mm -hmm. You can open up your course shell whenever you want. I've given my students access uh, almost uh, two weeks ago to okay. my courses, so you can just go on and change the course um, date in your particular one and you can open it right now. Is there any recommendation one way or the other to wait or to do it earlier? Well, uh, you want to make sure it's ready. And yeah, yeah. Our, our assumption right now is that most people are not ready or scrambling uh, to try to put this together. And so you, and, and so for you, there would not be a reason to, uh, to change the date then. Uh, but well, this is but, Paul. I'll, yeah. I'll take a different position on that. You can mm -hmm. let know hey this is a work in progress mm -hmm. uh, I've got the syllabus mostly updated you know here it's open to you so you can read through the sooner we get students looking at it and becoming comfortable with how we're going to do uh, this term I think better even if you don't have all the assignments tweaked and everything ready just be upfront with them and say hey I got week one mm -hmm. and um, take a look at that you know, the rest of the course, there's going to be some changes, probably, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. I mean, you if you want to start communicating with students right away, you can start sending them email uh, directly. In fact, you don't have to open it. You can send email through the, the summary class list. You can also send email through class class list here uh, as well and, and be sending the messages. But, but that's absolutely right. If you want to give them a, a peek, you can open it today and say, uh, okay, I've got my syllabus up there. I've got my welcome message and I'm, I'm working on the rest of week one and it'll be up there by Monday and ready to go. But I'm looking forward to working with you uh, during this unusual term. And, and that might add some comfort to, to the students and, and what they're feeling, the little bit of anxiety that they're feeling as well. So yeah, thank you, Paul. Okay, so let me just take a, a quick peek at our poll, 12 questions. All right, yeah, so number one is quite popular. What's it going to feel like as a remote instructor? How will I communicate with students? Five, should I create video? Okay, and six, how will I facilitate social connection and a sense of belonging? Definitely, all right, and uh, eight, how can I keep the technology requirements at a level that makes it, makes it possible for learners who only have a cell phone data plan to access? Yeah. How about if we, uh, how about if we try to take those four questions anyway? And also starting with number one. Yeah, Sam, Paul, Stacy, any of you would like to jump in on that? So what's it going to feel like as a remote instructor? How will I communicate with students? So kind of a communication plan. This is Paul. It's going to feel different. It's going to feel weird. Uh, I did my finals last week, which were group presentations using a Zoom session. And yeah, it was a completely different feeling. But uh, I think everyone will get used to it by the second or third week. I think you and the students will all be used to it. I think during this time, kind of leveraging on what I said a minute ago about thing is we need to over communicate. So this is going to be new to some students. So communicating by email, having your virtual office hours set up so that they can contact you via phone or email or video conference, uh, which by the way, I created a a uh, Google phone number that forwards to my cell phone number. So that's the phone number I'm using in uh, my syllabus. 
and I know, uh, I think I saw some emails earlier today where they were suggesting that you might want to do that uh, for the full-time faculty. <clears throat> if you have a phone number, that you can uh, forward it, you know, create it to forward to a different number using the Google phone, excuse me. Hi folks, uh, Sam Erickson here. Um, the, you know, Paul said it there at the beginning, for me, um, weird is the way it's going to feel. Uh, and I think, I think it's going to feel a little empty. Um, because as a, at least as a classroom teacher, like, I love getting in there and being with the students and feeling the energy and seeing them interact with each other and, and being in those moments. And I think that's just much harder um, through Zoom or, or in an online class. Um, and I think what Paul, the other thing that I would echo that Paul said is we over communicate. Like, uh, I think when I post an announcement, I'm also going to send in an email. Um, and when I, and then probably at the beginning of each week, uh, I'm going to just let students know. The other thing that I keep thinking about as, as we have changed so rapidly in the last 10 days is perhaps in the next 10 days, we will also need to adapt something that we are doing. And, and, um, Maybe we're going to try something in week one and it's just not going to be the thing we need. And, and I feel like we all need permission to, um, to hold our students harmless uh, and to adapt and to make choices that are best for us. Yeah, that's a crucial point, being ready to adapt uh, because you're going to do some things this week and think, well, oh, that did not work very well or maybe it worked great. You'll keep that up and, and you'll make small adjustments for the, for the next week uh, or maybe it's some large adjustments. Um, one thing I would try to to make sure you do is, I don't know, I, I do like the idea of using Zoom for an office hour for for one on one. And I guess this this gets into uh, number six as well. But the social connection, maintaining a connection with students right away, making yourself available. And it doesn't mean making yourself available all day online because uh, you've, you've got your time as well. Uh, just be clear about expectations about when when you can get back when you expect to answer questions and, and so forth but I would try to meet students yeah, it depends on your numbers if you've got 30 or 40 students it can be difficult um, but with a smaller number uh, try to meet them one on one on one even for even for 20 minutes to check in and see how things are going and see if they have any questions see if they understand the class uh, or if they have any feedback for you on something that would would help in terms of student learning uh, Greg, this is Stacy. I'll chime in with something else that I think um, I teach online quite a bit and I teach communication online. So, so much of it is about communication and connection. And one of the things that I think is really helpful is if you can find some time in either a pre-recorded video format or a one-on-one -on -one Zoom session to talk to your students about feedback you have on their assignments. You don't have to do it for every single assignment, but maybe by week three or four, you can have a quick check-in because um, in the online classroom where we're providing written feedback, our tone is something that uh, I think is really hard to convey without our, our voice and our facial expressions being there. And so we think that can be early on a really reassuring way to give encouragement and guidance on future assignments. And I know it's something that I've had students email me and tell me they really appreciate getting that feedback early on and knowing that I'm there and I'm paying attention to what you know what's happening in the classroom and that's made future conversations when they've had questions about assignments I think a lot more open and free flowing because they've had this interpersonal connection with me around some of their coursework early on and since we won't be in the classroom to talk about some of those things you might want to carve out a little bit of time to do feedback for one assignment um, or summative. Here's how things have been going the first three weeks or four weeks with them. Um, I had something to add. I, we, we went online at Lewis and Clark like the week before spring break. And one of the things that worked that, that I started doing that week was I had the full class meeting that everybody, I wanted everybody to join, but I also posted the recording if they couldn't. Um, and then right after that was an option to join one-on-one -on -one. and you can use the um, waiting room in Zoom so people can join and you can meet with them in the order that they join. And a lot of students took advantage of that. So that's how I was doing office hours. So people who weren't um, 
maybe didn't feel comfortable asking a question in the whole group or had something more specific they wanted to talk about, just joined directly afterward. And then we met that way. That way is still keeping it kind of contained, um, you know, for the two days that we met a week. Um, but it was a way to kind of do both things. Thanks, Bethany. And I see that uh, p folks have been raising their hands and, and you did too. So um, thanks for doing that because I didn't notice that before. And so I'll try to pay attention to that. I know there's a lot going on in the chat. Greg, that's coming up is people w would like to review how to set up one-to-one -one Zoom meetings. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's going to be helpful if you go to the Zoom training, uh, if you need some of the basic skills. So let me start out with that then. And in terms of setting up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom session, uh, you can do individual sessions if you'd like. With my class, I didn't do that. I created just one room and made it a recurring room. And maybe I can just share very quickly. So within, within here, within online rooms, you have, you do have the option of scheduling a time and scheduling individual meetings and they can be recurring meetings and that's great that's one way to do it and the room will open up at a certain time and they'll be listed in the calendar that way and that's a a good way to do the class meetings especially if you're going to be doing it each week then in that way um in in my class i would tend to create a, a room and then use this function here, recurring meeting. And then I just chose no fixed time so that the room is open and I can use the same link all the time for students. And that's, so that's the link that I use. And I, I direct students in that case instead to, to click on on online rooms to get to the room, to that one room each time then. Uh, and if you're going to use it for office hours, then um, as one of you mentioned, enable, enable waiting room is a good, can be a good approach uh, so that uh, you're not interrupted while you're talking with, with one student then. So just another way to do it. Yeah, this is Paul, just one caveat to that. When you create it that way, that room is open to the entire class and so if you're having a discussion with a student, you may be talking about student uh, grades and other things that need to be kept private. So if you do your office hours that way, you have to watch and make sure no one else has joined the meeting while you're discussing it. Mm -hmm. uh, a better way is to create an individual meeting just specifically for that student. Uh, so that's why I've been doing my office hours that way. I have the student call me during the office hours and then I create an on the fly one on one zoom session. So I know that I don't have to worry about someone else inadvertently joining the session. I only mm -hmm. use the class zoom meetings for the class time. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I use it. Uh, you can use it for class time. Yeah, that's why I had students sign up on a Google Doc uh, to pick times. Uh, so it, it didn't turn out to be an issue, but uh, absolutely correct. You want to make sure that nobody else joins you in the room if you're talking about sensitive material. This is Kate. If you um, do enable the uh, waiting room for students, where does that show up that on your screen that you see? Is that would that be under participants? To, to see if anybody's in the waiting room, how does yeah, that? Yeah, it, it's something like that. There's a special section that pops up that so-and-so has entered the waiting room and is requesting permission, waiting for you to allow them to come in. Yes. Okay, so we could just, um, as long as you tell students that it's kind of after everybody leaves and you'll go to the waiting room and, and it's mm -hmm. private, right? It's private. Well, they they the start yeah they start in the relate in the waiting room so when they enter your class they do not get into the the zoom meeting they'll get into the waiting room instead okay. and that and, is and private they, and, and that's that is, that's private but you private. don't meet them there you you get them to come in you uh you allow them to come into the main room at that time okay and is there something what would we click to have them do that then uh you know i don't have the screen right in front of me but there's there, there's something that says allow them to come in to that effect 
allow so-and-so to enter. I know some great. of the training sessions have been set up that way as well. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there's an interesting observation. Be careful what's in the background of your for your videos then, right? The visual backgrounds. Question five, if we, let's get to that one. Should I create video? And uh, if so, which tool? Um, oh, by the way, there, there have been a number of questions about use Zoom. Do you have to use Zoom? I mean, do you have to meet uh, students synchronously? And I, I think the answer is no, you don't have to do that. So if you want to just have discussions, um, you need to have some way of connecting with students in that way. So through the discussions, uh, Zoom is a good tool. We have it available. And since they are expecting to meet synchronously and not really used to the discussion type format, uh, I see it as, it's an opportunity. You don't have to use it. I think it's an opportunity if you would like to use it to connect with students uh, in person so you can see their face and, and uh, just get to know them for 20 minutes or an hour or whatever you'd like to spend. So it, it's an option for them for you to do that. Uh, I would recommend it. I would I would be doing it if I were teaching a face-to-face -face class to try to get some face-to-face -face contact with them. But you don't have to spend the whole time there either. It can be an hour out of the two hours or just a half hour then potentially. Make it a half hour and see if it develops into longer then. Don't feel that you have to lecture for that time to use that time for lecturing. Then. That might not be the best use of time. So that ties right into the video. Should I create a video? Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, some thoughts on that? Oh, and Greg, if, before we, mm -hmm. sorry, before we leave that, um, that mm -hmm. discussion about synchronous learning, um, yes, all of our students signed up for these classes at a particular time um, before all this happened. And I can only imagine that many of them have had their lives deeply disrupted, which means maybe they Maybe now they're working for Amazon and they weren't before and they don't have the time and space that they had when they were signing up or they're caring for people who are going to be around. And I think um, requiring synchronous meetings regularly uh, is not something I would recommend. Certainly. Yes. Right. And you might even take a poll to see what other time works, works better. I know the, the stipulation said that it should be during the class time, but um, I don't know. I think if, if it doesn't work well for you or your class, then you might find something else, some other solution. Or you might do everything asynchronous, except try to meet them individually, one-on-one, -on -one, perhaps. So see what's going to work best in your situation for that. Um, because it's true, many will not be able to make it during the, during the time. You can always record it, uh, but uh, yeah, you have to weigh the benefits and see. So what about getting, uh, yeah, so video ties into the connection, instructor presence, potentially. Um, Stacy, Paul, Sam, anything that you'd like to share about number five? Should I create video? If so, what tool? This is Paul, and uh, I created videos for all my classes uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, I found that that's one way for students with attendance challenges, you've got it already pre-recorded, prepared for them. And then I've been using the face-to-face -face time, which now will be a virtual face-to-face -face time, to discuss the recordings, the lectures, the information that I previously posted. And I use the D2L tool that's built in through my media, it's Kaltura, and then I Post, uh, I post the video on YouTube. And I chose to post it on YouTube uh, primarily because it does not a perfect and doesn't meet the rigid accessibility requirements for closed captioning, but it does a pretty good job. And so it's better than nothing at all. The um, Kaltura platform actually does machine captioning now, so that may be a uh, an alternative you don't need to, to pursue under YouTube if that's the only reason you're using YouTube because um, you can um, have machine captioning automatically on Kaltura videos and you can edit them after the fact if you want to. So speaking of Kaltura, so back on your original document, the resources at the bottom. See, I've added a link to 
Kaltura Capture Space screencasting video within D2L as well. And so here are some steps. We might be offering uh, some actual training in this, talking about that now, but but the uh, documentation is quite good, quite quite clear, including some, some pictures uh, and all. And it's fairly simple to use inside of D2L then. So that's one option for you. Uh, to, to use that. It's, it's a tool where you can, you can edit, uh, you can record for a bit. If you don't like it, you can stop and start over. And you can even do a little quick edits uh, using the tool. And then you are able to then connect and, and add, those, add those videos from within your uh, My Media area, uh, which is part of D2L. And so that, that's one option for you. Another option for you is, is Zoom. Uh, if you would like to record something in Zoom, it's not a, it's not a solution to rec recommend for long term, but since you are becoming familiar with Zoom, and if you feel comfortable for it, you could record, you could record something in Zoom and, and make it available to students. Um, you do have to wait quite a while for it to compile to get the video, to get access to the video and, and see if you like it or not, and you can't edit it either in that way. Somebody had a question. I think I saw a hand raised. Um, yeah, I just had, so is it, if you do a video, you know, on something else, like say iMovie or, or, or on a camera like that, is it best for D2L to have it through YouTube because you don't want to put that much, that large a file on D2L? Is it better, like, you know, is it better to have a link? I would upload it to Kaltura. Um, as, a, as opposed to YouTube? You could use YouTube. Sure. YouTube, basically the difference between Kaltura and YouTube is um, if you upload to YouTube, it has to be a personal account because you were not able to have a PCC Google YouTube account. Um, and um, they both do machine captioning and let you edit the captioning after the fact. So uh, they're comparable in that respect. Um, and then YouTube is fine if you want to have your material uh, publicly available. Um, there are settings in YouTube where you can restrict that, but generally that's the benefit of YouTube. Whereas with Kaltura, um, there isn't um, technically an option. You can share them in some ways, but generally you're not supposed you're you're using Kaltura because it's um, internal to PCC. Um, so right, if you're only right. using them for your class and nothing else, then there's no reason not to use Kaltura. So I do recommend uh, an occasional an occasional video. You don't have to do one every week, but but even a quick uh, okay, a quick seven minutes. Uh, that was my intro to the class and getting welcoming students and giving them some navigation information about uh, about the class getting started. But you could make a quick video screencast about your syllabus, for example. Um, so I did you know occasionally create a video for for the class, not every week, uh, but it's it's good for them to to hear your voice. Uh, it can be and to see actually see the screen and and what you're doing and and where to go, how to do something, uh, how to access uh, the feedback for an assignment and and so forth. Then, um, so you can hey, I would hey, I would Greg. consider that. Mm -hmm. And this yes. is Stacey. One other suggestion I would give is that even if you're not using video for teaching, like you're putting together really polished you know, teaching videos that actually the video note tool in D2L can be a really great way in your announcements page to just do a quick video check in with your students, even if it's not necessarily here's how to do an assignment or here's me delivering content, but me just mm -hmm. kind of framing the week for you and just doing a personal check in. Those can be super informal. Sometimes my students can hear the dog walking around in the background. I laugh about it. I move on. It's sort of like an opportunity for something that's a little bit more interpersonally connecting. And that video note tool built into D2L is capped at three minutes, so they're short, but it also is a really easy tool to use. Yeah, thanks, Stacy. So, yeah, the video note, uh, quick, and let's see, I think it lasts for six months, I believe, and then it's removed. Uh, but in a new announcement, for example, the video tool, video note that Stacy's talking about is right here, record video or record audio. And, and that's, that's a, a good option as well. Greg, I usually do it through the insert stuff button so that it embeds, oh. it embeds on the page instead yeah. of being an attachment. So Excellent. if you, yeah, if you right. open that and select a video note, 
um, mm -hmm. then that's where you can actually, the recorder just turns on and it will embed on the page so a student doesn't have to open an attachment. Yeah, excellent. There it is right there. So that's that's a great idea under uh, under insert stuff. Can, can, insert you stuff. Of, can you show what's above this, what your screen right now, the, the how you got to where you could click the insert mm -hmm. button? Right oh, that's just, that. oh, yeah. Now, Announcement. Okay, and that's, you got that's, the new announcements. How? Yeah. Uh, new announcements from the home page or from the announcement tool. Uh, announcements. Oh, right there on the front right page. Right there. New announcement. Right. New okay. announcement. Mm -hmm. And in the courses that, that you have, the course shell that you have, you've got the activity feed instead, which, let's see, with the activity feed in terms of inserting quick video. Uh, Michael, I'm not as familiar with the activity feed assignment. Let's see if you can add, maybe you can't. So maybe that maybe does not have access to the video note actually under. Yeah, I think you don't because I had an instructor specifically contact me and they wanted the announcements back because they couldn't figure out how to add a video. Oh, there's a video, attach video from web. Yeah, that's what they yeah, mentioned is yeah. that you can only attach one, you can't record one. So they, right. I, I've been swapping out the activity feed um, back to the announcements tool for a lot of instructors. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, let me just, let me just, uh, you know, that's a good quick thing for for you to know and it'll be part of this recording course admin you can go to and then uh this is a navigation bar oh you're looking at the nav bar not the uh, home page oh yeah okay we knew there was something wrong with that picture okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you and then i think it's the course default yeah, course default is the one you want. Course default, okay. I just wanted to give you all a tour of the nav bar area as well. I have to make an excuse. Okay, apply. And now, go back to course home. Yep, so there it is, announcements instead, instead of the activity feed. So that's how to swap it out. That's how to change, to change that. Why would we want to use announcements versus activity feed? Well, for one thing, if you wanted to use video note to add a quick video, announcements is a little, little bit more powerful, a little bit more powerful tool. You have more options under announcements if you add a new announcement. Um, also, it'll it'll copy over from course to course. So if you were to teach this course now and then want to use it again in summer, then it would copy over, whereas the activity feed would not, is how I understand it. Is that correct, Michael? Correct. Yeah. 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 I right. generally recommend announcements. It's it's definitely more fully featured, and, mm -hmm. and activity feed is really ephemeral and, and kind of goes away. The really only only the benefit for the activity feed over announcements is if you wanted students to respond, um, but that really is just a, a sort of a, a substitution for using the discussions. Let's see. Question six is six is kind of related to communication. We've talked about that social connection. Uh, being available. Uh, any Anything to add about that anybody wants to add about uh, that? Uh, number six, how I will, will I facilitate social connection and a sense of belonging in the class? Um, you know, just keeping, keeping contact, uh, regular announcements. Could be every few days, certainly every week an announcement, but it, it could be a couple of times a week. Occasional email messages to the class being available, but don't go overboard. You're not, you're not available 24 seven. Uh, they need to know that. Yeah. And Greg, I'd say, you know, a, a lot of the work that I've tried to do in my face to face classes, sorry, this is Sam Erickson, um, is to, to get to offload some of that social connection to student to student connection. And if we can facilitate study groups or other ways that students can communicate with each other, mm -hmm. we don't have to be the only um, node for that social communication. Definitely. You can add discussions. You can add, uh, in my classes, I like to have a coffee shop area where students can just come in and talk about whatever. Uh, but then then add some discussions to your class, some, some formal discussions. You could add a group discussion, put them in small groups if you have a larger class so they can connect with each other that way. 
Greg, this is Nellie. If I can second the discussion thing, I am in a university class right now and the instructor, there's, I think there's 70 kids in the class and she broke us up according to when our study times are. She gave us like a bunch mm -hmm. of options, broke us up. And then for the entire semester, we are with those seven people and it has prevented us from going to the instructor and asking questions. And instead we start asking each other those questions and getting the support we need there. So it, it helped level mm -hmm. out that, that workload Neat. for her. Thanks, Nellie. That's great. All right. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. A lot of interesting question number eight. So how can I keep the technology requirements at a level that makes it possible for learners who only have a cell phone data plan to access? So yeah, equity, access. Yeah, this is Paul Wheatcraft and the college has created a a page that lists resources to students, one of which Comcast has offered free high-speed internet access for two months for students. And so there's, uh, you know, if a student has only a mobile data plan, there are options where they can, uh, for this short period of time, get internet access. Okay. Uh, alternative assignments come to mind. So if there's something, you know, it's hard to imagine them writing a, writing a paper on a cell phone. Um, though I know some do, unfortunately, and I don't know how they do that. But maybe there's a chance of alternative assignments being flexible. Maybe they can create a, a video to show their, share their project instead. Uh, of course, not in a writing class, but, but maybe that's an option for some. So trying to be flexible. So thank you for coming today, otherwise, and uh, yeah, I hope it was useful. You're welcome to come to any of the sessions. The room is the same, so feel free. It's going to be a little bit different perhaps each time. There'll be different people involved, uh, so feel free to come. Thanks, and I'll hang around a little bit if you have uh, further questions.